Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Leader's Gambit, a conversation with Ralph Otha. My name is Jackie King, Executive Director of IBEC Global, and I'm delighted to be your host today. We're honored to have Ralph, um, the Chief Economist uh, of the World Trade Organization, join us for an in-depth discussion on critical issues shaping global trade. Global trade is a cornerstone of economic development and business growth. It serves a vital enabler, allowing businesses to expand their markets, innovate and compete on a global scale. In today's interconnected world, understanding that the dynamics of global trade is more important than ever. It helps businesses navigate challenges, seize opportunities and contribute to economic stability and prosperity. So the webinar today aims to shed light on these crucial aspects and provide valuable insights for decision makers. Today's webinar is particularly timely as it aligns with the release of IBEC Global's latest report, The Leader's Gambit. The report is a comprehensive guide for decision makers navigating the complex regulatory landscape in Europe and beyond. It evaluates and compares regulatory actions across different markets and major megatrends addressing the questions that often arise in boardrooms, such as how to manage regulatory contradictions and complexities in the global operations. More importantly, it suggests how leaders can actively shape these trends for common good. Some of the key takeaways from the report include the necessity of keeping markets open to enhance competitiveness, the crucial role of regulatory coherence in, in fostering innovation, and the importance of sustainability in ensuring long-term business viability and economic prosperity. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest, Ralph Osa. As I mentioned, Ralph is the Chief Economist of the W Trade Organization, a position which he provides strategic insights and economic analysis to guide the organization's efforts in promoting global trade. With a distinguished academic background, Ralph has contributed extensively in the field of international economics. He holds a PhD in economics from the London School of Economics and has held esteemed position at the University of Chicago and the University of, Sh of Zurich. His research focuses on economic effects of trade policies and he has published numerous influential papers on topics such as trade agreements, tariffs, globalization. Ralph's expertise and insights are invaluable as we explore the nexus between trade and business strategy in today's rapidly changing world. So Ralph, thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to your insights on how businesses can navigate the complexities of global trade, uh, how we engage young people and leverage trade for sustainability. So without further ado, let's jump right into the discussion and I'll begin with the question around open trade and competitiveness. So uh, everywhere you look, uh, every everything you read, competitiveness is the name of the game in European capitals and in fact, major markets around the world. But substantive actions need to go from diagnosis to into solutions mode. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our Leaders Gambit report has identified keeping markets open as an essential prerequisite for making competitive economies a reality. Um, but current national agendas are not aligned with this thinking, um, and you're seeing protectionist policies resulting from it. So as the chief economist of the WTO, what are your views as to how we can reconcile this? Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Jackie. It's great to be here. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. And um, first of all, um, I agree, of course, that um, open markets are absolutely essential to economic prosperity. <clears throat> you know, sometimes when uh, you talk about globalization, when you talk about international trade, these are such um, abstract words. But if you think about just your own life, or if I think about my own life, um, <clears throat> I think it's it's pretty clear that if I produced everything that I was consuming, uh, that this would be a recipe for disaster if it was in personal autarky, so to speak. So I think we all know uh, intuitively that the uh, division of labor is really an, a, a pillar of our prosperity. And, and whenever you have a division of labor, you need some exchange. And whether this exchange is just between you and me or across international borders, in some sense, uh, the effect is the same. So I completely agree with you uh, that open markets are a key pillar of our prosperity. But I also agree with you that open markets are under uh, pressure. So you 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 said this in your 
in your introduction and your question, we see rising protectionism. But more broadly, I think we just see a change of the narrative. So there's really uh, much more skepticism now towards uh, towards globalization. And my understanding of it, or my reading of it, it's not so much that people don't understand the economic gains from trade that you know we just talked about. But for me, <clears throat> it's more that people increasingly believe that we need to give up some of these economic gains in order to pursue more important policy objectives, in particular, to reduce uh, poverty and inequality, to maintain peace and security, and also to achieve a sustainable economy. So I think we want to counter this uh, protectionist narrative. Yes, we need to talk about the economic gains from trade, but we also need to make the case that trade is actually important, that it's actually important to embrace trade if we want to build a more sustainable, inclusive, um, and also secure world. So last year, we wrote a whole report, uh, our World Trade Report, on that. And just to give you, um, you know, one angle that, that we take in this report, perhaps just to get us started, you know, think about economic security. <clears throat> and when I say economic security, I just mean, you know, things like supply chain resilience. And, and of course, you know, coming out of COVID, we've all seen that, you know, supply chains can be, can be fragile and, and somehow, uh, people have concluded from this that you know there's a fundamental problem with international trade. We need to home shore, we need to French shore, we need to make more things uh, ourselves, we need to be self-sufficient. And and if you just look at what happened uh, during COVID, that's just not the right uh, conclusion to draw because yes, initially we had supply chain disruptions, but then pretty quickly, you know, we all needed to work from home. Where did the home office equipment come from? Where did the computers come from? Where does the, did the desk come from? And then later on, where did the masks come from? Where did the vaccines come from? And so on and so forth. This was an international effort uh, coordinated by, by global value chains and trade very quickly became part of the solution. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because, um, you know, think about <clears throat> uh, supply shocks. You never know where they're going to happen and you also never know who's able to, to step in. Um, so just relying on your friends or even worse, just relying on yourself uh, is clearly not 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 the best uh, strategy, and and what we always emphasize at the WTO is what you really need is you don't you not only need open markets, but you need open multilateral markets. So you need multilateral trade, because only this is going to give you what I sometimes call the flex security. It's going to give you the flex security to adjust to these shocks, because perhaps you cannot uh, supply the good that I need today, but then I don't know who else. And if I have um, many outside options given to me by this multilateral trading system, I think that's really what we need. Yeah, and that that's that's really well put, um, and and certainly that that comes up because I think when people think of trade, it it is between two nations, but that multilateral piece is is absolutely absolutely crucial, especially when you think about. Um, you know uh, the security of supply and the security of market options. Mm -hmm. Um, it, you know, you, you you touched on all of the, um, all of the you know the hype around you know globalization is in retreat, and you're seeing protectionism almost rise as nationalism to, to to do the very things that citizens are are expecting. Mm -hmm. Take care of me, take care of me at home. So with all of that hype in the media, and and with 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 you know doomsday and and doom and gloom around globalization and retreat what what do you say to that are you seeing that in the numbers and and what can business leaders take away from that and and should they be worried or should they you know um take it with a grain of salt well it's a it's a good question and and i think we should be worried but i also don't think it's too late so so i really think we are at a at a critical moment in the history of globalization and the policy choices that we make now i think are really going to um, affect the course of, of where this is going to go. For now, I have to say the world economy, including international trade, is remarkably resilient. Um, so last year we saw the volume of world merchandise trade, just to give you some numbers, uh, fall by 1.2%. Uh, for this year, we're already predicting it to go by 2.6%. For next year, by 3.3%. You look at services trade, um, it's it's much uh, stronger even. So it's not that you know trade uh, has been has been falling off a uh, off a cliff, um, but it's certainly not growing as fast as it did, for example, before the global financial crisis. So if anything, we are seeing a slow-globalization now, but not a de-globalization. So, so from that angle, 
you know, it's, you know, you, you see this remarkable resilience. At the same time, what we also see is you see fragmentation uh, along geopolitical lines. So, for example, trade between China and the United States still holding up strong, but as a share of their total trade, it's shrinking quite, uh, quite quickly. So, um, you know, U.S. imports from China have grown 30% less than U.S. imports from uh, other countries, and similarly, uh, similarly for China. So you see some change in the importance of that relationship, and this is true actually more broadly. So what we've done is we've, um, we've um, just, you know, to, to make this point, we uh, grouped uh, countries in, uh, of the world into two hypothetical geopolitical blocks based on voting behavior in the UN General Assembly, who tends to vote with the United States, who tends to vote with uh, China. And what you see is, you know, historically, trade within these two quote-unquote blocks has been grown, has been growing just as quickly as trade within these blocks. So trade within as fast as trade between. Um, but now, since the start of the war in Ukraine, you see the within block trade growing faster than the between block trade. So you see some evidence of uh, French shore. Nothing dramatic at this point, really just first signs of fragmentation. But, you know, this is clearly a, a fragile moment, uh, I would say, where policy choices really are going to make a difference. Yeah, it, it really is um, a, a critical point. And, and when you talk about fragmentation and you just, you, you, you spoke about, um, it, you know, trade is realigning around certain geographies and, and, mm -hmm. and, and it was interesting to see um, how, how, you, uh, how you looked at it from, from voting lines. Um, so, so would you say it's fragmenting or it's, it's being reconfigured as, as, as relationships, geopolitical relationships change? And, and are there more opportunities around that? What, what should we watch for in that space? Well, it's a it's a good question. So I think overall, um, it's uh, it's something that we are concerned about. So we've uh, we've we've done some simulations where we say that the worst case scenario, if this uh, fragmentation, this geoeconomic fragmentation continues, a global real income could be um, uh, a hit could could take a hit of uh, as much as five percent. Um, but again, you know, coming back to how we started the conversation, in some sense, I don't think that's the that's the main point we want to make. The main point we want to make is not so much that it's costly economically, even though it is. The main point that we want to make is if we want to actually build a more secure, inclusive, and uh, resilient, uh, resilient world, fragmentation is just not uh, the way to go. If you think about it from a business perspective, <clears throat> um, uh, of course, there are some opportunities. I mean, you see Vietnam uh, thriving, you see Mexico thriving, um, you know, you see uh, all these China plus one uh, countries uh, thriving, so to speak, you know, countries where firms might be, you know, diversifying their supply chains too. I also see opportunities for Africa, particularly when you think about the green transition also. But, um, but we have to make sure not to lose sight of the big picture, of course. And the big picture is that, you know, fragmentation is probably not the way to go. Yeah, could, couldn't agree more. And and I think, you know, it's not just focusing on what the challenges and issues are now. We have to look to the future. And so mm -hmm. if we think about the next generation and some of our younger generations um, that will be at the forefront of, of, of what happens in global trade, um, it, in that case, perception creates reality and different polls indicate that young people, uh, a fundamental group to keep international cooperation is alive and kicking, they're also trade skeptics. Um, your own cost simulations on geopolitical fragmentation show uh, global incomes could fall by 3% in worst case scenarios. So how can we involve young people in open markets and what are some other considerations on trade and inclusion you would like to share with this group? I mean, I think it's so important to really think about the narrative. So what you said at the beginning that perceptions uh, shape reality, I think it's so true, which is also why you know, we're really trying to work on the work on the narrative because nowadays, especially in rich countries, you know, here in, in Switzerland, where I live at the moment, you know, if you tell someone, well, this is going to cost 5% of world uh, income, but in return, it's going to save the environment or it's going to bring you peace and prosperity. Uh, sorry, it's going to bring you peace or it's going to um, uh, in increase uh, economic inclusion. You know, many would probably say, and rightly so, uh, I suppose, would say, um, well, I'm, I'm going to take that hit. So I think it's really important to make the case that uh, 
that, that, that it's not a trade-off actually, but that with the right kind of globalization, we can, we can achieve all these goals, not just economic prosperity, but all these non-economic or at least semi-economic objectives. So, so, so let's think about inclusiveness, for example. If you go, if you take an economics class today in the, you know, in, in the, in the Western world, I would say, and, and the topic of trade and inclusiveness comes up, uh, what you're most likely going to learn about is the um, labor market implications of uh, import competition from China. So China joined the WTO in, in early 2000, exports particularly, particularly to the United States soared, and this, you know, had detrimental uh, impacts on the on the U.S. labor market, certainly on certain regions uh, within the U.S. where some people uh, lost their jobs. And, and this is a uh, an important literature, and I think it's something that that, that, that we all need to take seriously and we all need to study. But what we don't talk about, and I think need to talk about much more, is that the, the same, <clears throat> so the other side of the coin, is that Chinese growth um, is the greatest economic miracle of the last decades, literally lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, uh, reduced extreme poverty uh, in the world dramatically. I mean, just look at the numbers. And that's all uh, because of, um, uh, not all, but, but but certainly trade was an important driving force of that. So if you think about trade and inclusion, I would just encourage people, you know, don't just look at this uh, uh, experience in the U.S. labor market, and we can talk about that too. I have some qualifications there too. But think about the big picture, and, and instead ask yourself, well, how could we make trade an engine uh, of growth in other developing countries too? And there, um, I'm really thinking about the. Uh, 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 digital and thinking about services. So when we think about the future of trade, we think about digitally delivered services because you know come back to COVID and um, and and remember how how much easier it was to work from home than we all thought. I think in the United States at the moment, about a third of hours I think I worked from home. I'm not totally sure if I have the numbers uh, right there, but a significant uh, share of of work is performed from home. <clears throat> And of course, working from home is, uh, uh, you know, within your country is, is is one thing you can do, but you can see how this might extend possibly to also, you know, working from home, so to speak, across countries, and and how this could be amazing development opportunities for countries that have so far not benefited from international trade, that so far had a hard time, you know, uh, integrating into into global markets, for example, in Africa. So I think we also need to see this side of the trade and inclusion uh, story. Yeah, uh, again, uh, uh, excellent <clears throat> points. And I think with this generation, it, you know, you can talk talk about numbers and statistics, but when it come, comes to these these um, these younger people, and and you brought up COVID, um, you're hearing more and more stories about. Um, younger generations and they're starting business businesses. They're they're very entrepreneurial, but they see because they're digital natives, they they don't see borders in in a sense. Exactly. But, but so one of the benefits to promoting global trade um, uh, with this generation is to really narrow down some of the benefits uh, to to them as individuals and them as future business leaders and them as future um, you know travelers around the world looking for new opportunities. So, so in addition to opening up opportunities for businesses they might start and potentially having opportunities where there are trade agreements to, to move as, as part of a labor force, what are some of the other tangible benefits that some young leaders can take on board and, and, and move towards this part of I mean, the global trade? I mean, I think you already, you already said it, you know, most of them take uh, open trade for granted in the digital realm and don't realize that you can't take it for granted at all. So, for example, at the WTO, we have a, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's a moratorium on customs duties on electronic transmissions, which means that countries have agreed not to impose import duties, for example, on, on electronic transmissions. For example, if I download some music, uh, you don't have to pay an import tariff, but that's not set in stone. That's the result of an agreement that we have here at the WTO. Uh, which at our last ministerial conference has been extended for two more years, and now the question is, well, how is this going to how is this going to proceed? There's questions about uh, data flow regulation. I mean, <clears throat> um, um, you know, there, there there are all these concerns when it comes to digital trade, when it comes to e-commerce, all these privacy concerns. 
uh, there's a there's a question of well, how do I ensure this as a country, and how how does this compare to how you ensure it, and does this create trade frictions and so on. So in 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 the, in the digital space, I think if we want it to 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 remain to, to remain open, uh, we also need a conducive uh, regulatory environment, and this is not uh, set in stone. So we do need uh, uh, international organizations like the WTO to really to really underpin it, and we need the WTO members who are ultimately driving this place. And to really um, also, you know, put the efforts in this direction. Yeah, and 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 you know, you hit on um, you know the, the digital side of things and the importance of that. You know, sustainability, especially you know, we just talked about the younger generation, sustainability and mm -hmm. climate, and all of those things are important to that generation. So, and and that certainly was one of the three mega trends we address in depth in yes. our leaders' report is sustainability and climate change. So, how can we embrace international trade to move closer towards climate goals and and it maybe give us your insights from an economic perspective as well yeah so this is a this is a extremely important and, and this is also something where i feel particularly uh, strongly because some of the research i've also done uh, done done myself um <clears throat> so it's it's the same theme i think international trade is really an important part of the solution and not necessarily an important part of the problem so if, when people think about trade uh, they think they typically think about transport, and when they think about transport, they think about dirty trucks, they think about dirty ships, they think about dirty planes. So, understandably, um, they associate trade with problem when it comes to sustainability and not with a solution. But what we forget often is that transport emissions are only a relatively small share of overall emissions, and there's actually large variation in production emissions across countries. So, um, even though trade causes additional transport emissions it may help you save from production emissions and um, so i call this green sourcing and and it's it's easiest to grasp if you just you know say well say you, you make something uh with lower production emissions than than i do then me importing it from you maybe a net benefit to the environment even though i have to incur these um incur these uh, transport uh, transport emissions but then you know, you have to think, obviously, this logic doesn't really scale up because we can't all buy everything from Switzerland or Norway or whatever, you know, the lower emissions uh, countries are. So you really have to think about it in a macroeconomic sense. And, and, and what, we, what we have shown is that, you know, just like there's economic gains from trade and the economic gains from trade come from countries specializing in what they're relatively good at, there's also environmental gains from trade. And these environmental gains from trade come from countries specializing in what they're relatively green at. So it's about all of us shifting our um, resources a little bit to sectors in which we are relatively green, even if we might be absolutely uh, brown, so to speak. And we've done some simulation. So I, I should say, I'm, I'm not claiming that this happens automatically. So it's not that trade is automatically part of the solution. You need the right policies in place, um, in particular policies that help uh, firms, that help households internalize these kind of, um, externalities on the environment that their production and consumption decisions are causing. And we've done a simulation where we said, well, let's suppose there's a worldwide carbon tax. And I'm not, uh, I know that that's not a realistic uh, scenario. So we've also done all sorts of robustness checks, but just, just for the sake of argument, suppose there's a worldwide uh, carbon tax. <clears throat> now, what does it do? What it increases, um, obviously makes uh, emissions intent of goods more expensive. And, and then we uh, and, and reduces carbon emissions, and then we decompose this into three effects. We say, well, first of all, you're going to make a little bit less, sure. Um, then you're going to shift consumption from relatively brown sectors to relatively green sectors. That also makes sense because the relatively brown goods have now become relatively more expensive. And the scale effect, that this decomposition effect, uh, this uh, 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 yeah, this not decomposition effect, the scale effect and the composition effect have nothing to do with international trade. But there's a third effect, which is that um, goods from green countries now become relatively cheaper, or goods from brown countries now become relatively more expensive. So this carbon uh, uh, tax would actually uh, incentivize this uh, green sourcing. And what we, what we found in, in our simulations is that more than one third of the greenhouse gas emissions reductions brought about by a carbon tax would come uh, from this uh, green sourcing effect. In other words, these environmental gains from trade would be a very strong force multiplier for climate policy. So it's not that trade is automatically the solution to everything. 
It's just that if you play it right, it can really be uh, an important uh, force multipliers for the policies that put in place. Yeah, and 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 I think I think you're right. Trade trade won't solve it all. There's obviously international cooperation, and <clears throat> but but I think it provides a really solid framework. And certainly um, over the past number of years, we've seen a modernization, if you will, um, in in trade agreements where there are particular clauses around um, social and environmental mm -hmm. um, components. Um, and and so maybe maybe it's a two part question. So what what do you say to skeptics uh, of those agreements, saying it just holds things up? You're in, in, you know imposing you know your your morals or or your values mm -hmm. on on countries that don't necessarily. So that's the first question. And then and then the second question. Well, I'll leave the second question for last. I'll let you answer that one first. No, this is a, it's an important question and, and, and perhaps what I can do, well, the, the main thing I can say myself is I can just say, whatever, I mean, yes, we need these environmental policies, but we also need to put them in place in a cooperative way. And this is easier said than done. And and maybe I can report a little bit just what, what our members here say. I mean, we have 164 members with, with a lot of uh, diverse um, uh, positions. And and of course, there's, there's, there's some members that say, well, we need, um, aggressive uh, environmental policies that are also trade related, not just to decarbonize our own economy, but also to create incentives for other countries to decarbonize. But there's also the flip side, especially of countries from the global south that look to the global north and said, well, first you ruined the environment and now we have to pay for it, um, which I think is also an important uh, dimension. So I think there's not an easy solution here, but somehow you know, we, we all know, I think, that we need to take climate action. Uh, we all know that we need to embrace international trade, or maybe we don't all know, but that's certainly something I would advocate for. But we need to somehow find a way to do this uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a fashion that is both efficient, but is also perceived as, uh, as equitable. And I think the, the, the difficult discussion there is what, what we're going to do with um, uh, with with historical uh, responsibilities, what are we going to do with uh, differential capabilities and so on? Because all the things that are, you know, discussed in the in the climate realm, in the realm of climate policy, but not so much in the realm of trade policy. So these are some difficult discussions that our members need to have and are currently having. Yeah, and 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 I think the importance around that, the build on to that is, is how do we achieve a certain level of uh, regulatory coherence exactly. um, as, as a result of, if we were if we're going to be really efficient and effective in achieving our common goals and um, um, and certainly um, and and becoming more prosperous and competitive um, so maybe the last question um, okay. just building building on that one uh, how trade agreements have evolved what what trends are you seeing that we should be watching for as business leaders in in either in the area of trade or uh, trade agreements, both in terms of challenges, maybe opportunities as well, what, what you're seeing in your work? Well, this is not very helpful, but what I would say is that the trend is really that things are getting more complicated. <laughs> and that's just because all things are just more cross-cutting. You know, it used to be that you do environmental policy and environmental agreements and security policy and security agreements and trade policy and trade agreements. Now it's everything together, you know, it's trade and the environment. I mean, just look at what we talked about today. We talked about trade and inclusiveness. We talked about trade and sustainability. We talked about trade and security, and it all um, interlinks, overlaps. So I think the reality is just that, that, that these discussions have become more complex and, and we need to um, kind of break down the silos also of policy domains of, of even international organizations. So we're trying to do that, um, you know, uh, at least at, at least from our perspective, work more with the World Bank, work, work more with UNFCCC, work more with IMF, work more with UNCTAD, and so on and so forth to get this uh, to get this broader perspective. Um, <clears throat> so 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 that would be one trend, which I uh, admittedly, which admittedly is not is not so helpful, I think, for the uh, for the for the business community. I mean, the other trend that we are seeing at the WTO, so the WTO is, is, is all about multilateral trade and multilateral negotiations, but it's based on consensus. So we have to, so for, for, for things to really move forward here, we need 164, soon 166 countries to say yes. And as you can imagine, that's difficult. So one trend that we see here is so-called plurilateral agreements, uh, which is 
it, 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 it's kind of like um, a coalitions of the willing, uh, if you will, but it's um, it's closer to multilateralism than preferential trade agreements, I would say, because it's typically open to the to the rest of the membership. So 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 that's a that's another trend. And then maybe the third thing I would say, maybe just not thinking about trade policy, but just you know thinking about the future of trade. I mean, I really think that the future of trade is, is services. It's uh, digital, and it's going to be green. And especially with uh, with the green, there's going to be new. There's going to be a change in the pattern of comparative advantage. So, for example, green energy we know is relatively hard to um, transport, and it's much harder to transport than brown energy. You can't just put you know electricity on a on a ship as easily as you can put oil on a ship. So, I think what's going to happen is that energy intensive production, steel, and so on is sooner or later going to move closer to um, areas that can produce renewable energy uh, cheaply. Um, and, and I think we're going to see quite some change in the pattern of trade, simply because the global economy has to decarbonize. Yeah, and, and of course that, that will um, improve cost effectiveness and, and affect both national economies and the pocketbooks of the citizens that they serve. So. Um, uh, and, and I think you're right about the cross-cutting issues that it, it's been very siloed and I think the approach that you and your colleagues are taking and, and engaging with other organizations is certainly um, even, even within the EU bloc um, coordinating mm -hmm. and cooperating across uh, the nations exactly. but also within departments within government they tend to exactly. be siloed and all which is why we wanted to look at those mega trends because they affect everybody. Um, and that includes businesses that are so used to looking down into their industry and, and having a narrow view of things that it really is more cost cutting. We haven't even touched on innovation and AI yet. And I think yes, we yes, have a yes. whole, another webinar on that, but, but, but for now we are, we are unfortunately out of time. And I, just want to thank you so much, Ralph, for joining us today and, and for providing your insights. Uh, we'll provide links to the WTO um, um, resources and, and some of the information that, that you shared with us today, because I think it's important for people to stay on top of those, those kinds of things and the important research that you're putting out. So thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to seeing how things evolve. Thanks so much, Jackie, for having me.